I also have three different kinds of tablespoons. And you know what else is in the English system? A pinch. I bet with his hands and her hands, they'd have different size pinches. And you know how they measure horses in the English system? Hands high at the withers. So my horse would be shorter if I measured it than her because her hands are smaller than mine. It's not reliable. It is not reliable. If you go to Canada and say, I'd like a gallon of gas, do you know they put five quarts in? It's an imperial gallon in Canada. The U.S. gallon has four quarts. How many of you know how many ounces are in a pint? Because I don't. Nobody does. You don't know how many fluid ounces are in this, do you? You know, it's probably about a half a liter. Well, well 16 ounces? It, it, uh, I think it is 16. This one is 600 milliliters. <laughs> and it's just, oh, I'd be blind to read it. Oh, I was going to say, it's not in the U.S. because in the U.S. you have to dual label both ounces and milliliters. So anyway, the English system that we use is unreliable, which is why we don't use it in science. Nobody knows what it means. Now, the metric system was designed in 1789. 162, 161 countries use it soon to be 162, and it's based on the meter. And the meter is an exact division of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. So all you have to do is measure the North Pole to the equator, divide by the number they say, and you'll get a meter. And you can go to Paris, and in a glass box with argon gas kept at a constant temperature is the meter stick. That's exact and the same size in Peking as it is in Tokyo or Ottawa. So remember, the metric system is reliable. Everyone knows what you're talking about when you say a milliliter, or a meter, or a kilometer. And the English system is not. How many stone do you weigh? That's an English measurement. Yeah, I went to visit my friend in England and she said, I gained two stone three. And I said, take them out of your pocket before you get on the scales. She said, no, a stone is 12 pounds. I said, you're kidding me. You gained a lot, over 25 pounds? You really should take the stones out of your pocket before you get on the scale. So anyway, point is, Reliable means everybody knows what you're talking about. There is a standard in the world and everyone can find it. Now, repeatable is what she said. If you buy that meter stick in Buenos Aires and you come up here and you measure this tabletop, it will be the same thing yesterday as it is today and tomorrow. And if you buy a meter stick in Peking, it will be the same number. That's repeatable. Now, that leads us to we have to use the metric system in science. You can't put degrees Fahrenheit down anywhere, inches anywhere on anything in science, period. Uh, so that means that the United States is about 20% converted to the metric system. Now here's something you'll find very shocking. We are officially a metric country. Officially, Congress declared that we were a metric country uh, back in the 80s, they said, we will gradually convert to the metric system. And on January the 1st, 2000, we will officially be a metric country. And they never repealed the law. Now, the man who got it through Congress was a nuclear scientist. He has a BS degree in nuclear science. He was actually a president who served in the military, not avoided it. He served on a nuclear submarine, and he was an engineer. What was his name? President of the United States, a nuclear engineer. Hint, he got his BS in nuclear engineering from Georgia Tech University. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. That's right. Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, 
and he was a scientist, and he said, you know, if there's going to come a time when what we make, we can't consume enough of. In other words, our economy will not grow anymore because we can't sell to ourselves anymore. And we're going to have to sell to 161 other countries in the world, and they're on the metric system. And so if we want to sell our things over there, we are not going to be able to sell a two-inch boat to China, to four billion people there. They don't know what a two-inch bolt is, and it won't fit anything they've got. And so, believe it or not, this was back in the days where the different parties cooperated for the betterment of the country, instead of lurching from one crisis to the other and postponing us going bankruptcy till September the day before, you know, and all that crap that they do now. The Congress passed the bill the Metric Conversion Act, put forward by Jimmy Carter. And it was to gradually convert the United States from the 1980s to the year 2000 to the metric system without all that hysteria. Because, you know, if you said that today, people would riot in the streets, oh my God, we're going to convert to the metric system, what will we do, oh Lord, Mother of Heaven? Because everybody remembers fifth grade when you had to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit or meters to inches, and we all freaked out and have forgotten the formulas. Remember, you won't have to convert if you're not using the English system anymore. It's base 10. And people say, oh, I can't work with base 10. Yes, you can. Dollar. We're the first country in the world that had metric money. 100 cents. 10 cents. It's a metric system. So, anyway, Carter got it through Congress and it created the Metric Conversion Board. Half the board was business and half were sciences. And they were given hundreds of millions of dollars to convert the United States slowly to the metric system. And the very first thing that was converted was cars. All cars are metric. Why? We used to make a lot of cars and sell a lot of cars overseas before we started making crappy ones and now we're making better ones. And your car is no longer a 354 cubic inch V8. It's a 4.2 liter V8. And the button there says kilometers per hour or degrees centigrade. Everything on your car is metric. So that we can sell cars overseas and we can ask them to build parts which they can then sell back to us cheaper. And the next thing that was supposed to happen was every product in the United States was to be dual labeled. So if it's made here, it will have on it both ounces and milliliters. And if it's made for export, the milliliters like uh, Kirkland bottled water, which is sold by Walmart, five, it'll say 500 milliliters. And then it'll say 12.69 fluid ounces or whatever. This one is made for use here, so it says 355 milliliters or 12 fluid ounces. It's all dual label. And you can tell if it's made for export because the number of milliliters will be an even number. If it's made for local consumption, there where people understand the English system, then it'll be 12 fluid ounces or 16 fluid ounces or that sort of thing. And the next thing that was supposed to happen is that all road signs would be half and half. And if you take the 90 to Palm Springs, you will see a few of those road signs that went up during that time. It'll say 117 kilometers or 83 miles to Palm Springs. Everything was to be dual. And when you pumped your gas, it would you could press a button and pump out in gallons or liters. And then next, all publications like architectural designs, you would have a page that designed this floor in the metric and one in the English in the same uh, drawings. And if you had a Betty Crocker cookbook, one page would be in cups and pinches, and the other one would be in milliliters and grams. And then finally, all announcements, like on television, would be like, tomorrow will be 37 degrees centigrade or 96 degrees Fahrenheit. And then finally, 
on the year, on the day, January 1st, 2000, the English system would be discouraged. In other words, they would say, you know, they would start saying things only in the metric and only if you asked would they tell you what it was in the English system. And what happened? Ronald Reagan was elected president. <laughs> and Ronald Reagan said, like he normally did, he didn't change the law, he didn't go through the process, he just ignored it. <laughs> he did not appoint anyone to the metric conversion board. So there were no regulations. He did not give any money to the metric conversion board so that it could be processed. But he didn't change the law, so we officially became metric. Even though we're not. So we're like this. 20% converted to the metric system. The only thing in the United States that is completely metric is the auto industry and science. And you think our Congress has the courage to do something big like that now? Are you crazy? They can't even pass a budget. <laughs> so anyway, what you're going to get from this is the standard system worldwide is the metric system. And in science, we use only the metric system. And the United States is official, but isn't in the metric system. All right, what, mean, what is meant by being assigned a number that means the same thing to everybody? It's a sad story. Yes, I was never terribly good at math, which is why I tell you on when you get your papers today, add it up, because sometimes I see 78 and it's 87. <laughs> so you're supposed to add these things up and check that the right things on your grade sheet because I have dyslexia. I ruined a $750,000 piece of equipment at the CDC because my boss said set the ultra centrifuge one mark below 120,000 revolutions per minute. I sent it one mark above and it blew up. Oh, no. <laughs> so. Anyway, numbers are important. I was never good, terribly. I was pretty good at arithmetic. Algebra the second time I aced it. Um, <laughs> geometry was my thing. Oh my God, I love geometry. You know, you can measure the height of a flagpole from the top, from the shadow using the time of day. You can find the volume of a cube or a sphere, the Pythagorean thing. Oh man, I was great at this stuff. I got a 98 average going into the final. Every day when she posted the uh, homework assignment 10 minutes before the end of class, I had it done by the end of class. She asked me to help the stupid ones. It was great. <laughs> I went into the final exam, finished 45 minutes before everybody else. Handed in, absolutely sure, 99, 98, something like that. Came back Monday morning, 83. <laughs> you know that feeling? You know that one where you get... First it goes cold, and then it comes back up and goes hot, and it goes over and over like that, and then you start shaking. And so I started looking at it, and she would put on the board all the answers. And I, she got to number four. It was 9.71, and I had 9.71. I didn't scream out. <laughs> I just went running up and interrupted her, and she said, calm down. And I said, but you marked it off. I'm going to get a B plus in this class because you marked it off and I got 9.71 and she said 9.71. Camels, bananas, in science and math, without a standard reliable unit, it's nothing. A three means nothing without a unit. Not a unit, that's where you, you know, that's E-U-N. Okay. Okay. <laughs> unit. All right. Now, remember there are, though, in science, two kinds of numbers. There are soft numbers and hard numbers. Hard numbers have metric units. Math, physics, biology, microbiology, anatomy, physiology. They have hard numbers. But we have two sciences that are science, but they don't use hard numbers. What are they? Psychology. Psychology and sociology. Right. Psychology. Go to a psychologist and drive them nuts. Yeah. Sit down and say, what's IQ? <laughs> what's meant by IQ? If she has a quarter of the IQ of you, can I get two of, can I get four of her to equal you? <laughs> can you add, subtract, and divide IQ? No. 
And if you ask them, what is IQ? They say, well, if you give them this test, and then you say, well, is that for everybody? Well, no, actually, it's designed for white, suburban, middle-class males. So if you're not that, it doesn't measure too well. You mean there's eight different IQ tests? Yeah. Well, if I take all eight, will I get the same number? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> well, it's hard to explain. And then there's one, my favorite one was MMPI. Anyone ever heard of it? Minnesota Multiple Personality Inventory. It's a series of yes and no questions. 400 of 373, I think, of them. And it gives seven measures of your personality from positive to paranoia. And they seem to be just innocent little questions. You sit down, every policeman, everybody that's in the military that's, you know, going to press a bomb or something, has to take the MMPI. You don't want a paranoid schizophrenic pressing the button or pulling, you know, driving your LAPD car. And what's so interesting is that the questions are extremely simple, like, do you sometimes think people are following you? <laughs> That's number 11. Number 116 is, do you look behind and often see the same person? <laughs> number 300 is, do you feel someone's looking over your shoulder? Now, it's just like I asked my questions, remember? You can't memorize them. Sometimes I ask the front door, sometimes I ask the back door. It's the same question. What's the most important thing in doing a smear? Washing the slide. Well, then what do I say? Removing the oil on the other question right next to it. It's the same thing, but ask a different way. And the one that really got me is, do you often have loose bowel movements? That was number eight. <laughs> Number 200 said, do you often have diarrhea? Number, I think it was 360 said, are you often constipated? Now, if you had diarrhea at the beginning of the test, in the middle you were constipated, and at the end you had loose bowel movements, there's a problem. They look for consistency of answers of the same question put in different ways. And then they will give you a measure on all seven scales of personality. And of course, certain scales should not be handling a submachine gun. So, but, are those numbers that you get on the seven scales additive? Can you add them up? Multiply, divide them? No. Psychology is an interesting science in the fact that the numbers do mean something, but not much to the individual. To groups of people, we can predict behavior. I can do testing to see whether or not how you would vote in here, and then poll and find out exactly how you voted, and I'll be almost exactly correct. You can predict behavior of large groups, not individuals. Uh, sociology is the same way. Uh, one of them is they come in with teacher evaluation. I hate those. You know why? They come in with, first of all, they kick me out. And they come in and they hand you this little 10 page question. It says, on a number line from 0 to 10, where 0, you never met the man, and 10, he's Jesus Christ. How did Dr. Hicks communicate complicated concepts in microbiology? And then the next one is, on a scale of 0 to 10, where you, 0, you never met the man, and 10, he's Jesus Christ, how fair do you think his grading system was? And you know what you will do? I have discovered exactly what you will do. If you've got an A, I'll get a 9 or an 8. If you've got an F, I'll get a 5 or a 4. You know what the college will do? If she gave me an 8 and he gave me a 4, they will add them together and divide by 2 and say I'm a 6. They will add, subtract, divide, and average opinions. So needless to say, I don't like soft numbers terribly, but I do recognize their value. But let's talk about numbers that pretend to be something. I had, just for this year, a Pontiac G6 convertible. Hmm. Now, which would you rather have, a BMW 3 Series or a Pontiac G6? Six is big. <laughs> Trust me, take the BMW, it rusted out after one year, my, my Pontiac G6. The top was rusty. 
when I traded it and wasn't nine months old. You know, they didn't make terribly good cars three years ago. So, lots of times in advertising, they use numbers to fool you into thinking something's better. Remember, the Europeans made a lot better cars than we did in the 70s and 80s. So instead of making better cars, we figured out they put numbers on theirs, so we put numbers on ours. Instead of making it better, we just put numbers. So we had a Pontiac 600. Would you rather have the Mercedes 250 or would you rather have the Pontiac 600? Well, the Pontiac 600 doesn't even have a radio. It's stripped. But we put numbers on them. They sound better, don't they? So they use for advertising. Then finally, statistics. Statistics is used throughout science to compare numbers, to see if they're the same or different. And, but also, do you know what we as scientists call, I mean, we don't say it to the statistician's face. We never say it to a psychologist's face that you have soft numbers. Try not to insult them. But to a statistician, as soon as they walk away, you know what we say stat statistics is? The mathematical science of lying. <laughs> you see, you can make statistics say anything you want it to say, so long as the people you're telling it to don't understand statistics. And you can prove it to them. See, the LA Times will come out with these things like yesterday they said, uh, just three years ago, 47% of, Amer of Californians approved of um, gay marriage. In a poll taken yesterday, 61% of Californians now approve and the, we believe the mood of Californians is changing. The problem is you don't know whether to believe that because there's two things they omitted. First of all, in how many people did they ask? Three? You see, if they don't tell you in number, you have no idea. Remember, it has to be somewhere around three to 5,000 before you get anything that's predictable. So they can say, well, I, we did ask just five. And they come up with it, and they can prove that statistic. They only asked five. So remember, you've got to know the end number. And then the last one is level of significance. That means how much can you tr trust the answer? You've got to have a large end number. And then the level of significance, there's only three. 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. This is within an estimate. So if somebody says, I did it on 5,000 people and I got a 0.1 level of significance, that means that's just as good as an estimate. <coughs> it's garbage. Most scientific experiments are 0.01 level of significance. What's that mean? Mathematically, they can be wrong only one out of a hundred times. So you can be pretty confident that they are right unless they missed an error. And once in your lifetime, you might do an experiment that is to the 0.001 level of significance, which means your chances of being wrong are only one in a thousand. And that happens once in a lifetime if at all in your whole lifetime, if you did experiments all your life, you would find this. This is called a big signal. This is a moderate signal. And this is no signal. You didn't hear anything. These are how loud the numbers speak, how much you can trust them. So anyway, remember numbers have to mean the same thing to everybody. And if they're using statistics to convince you, what two things do they have to give you? And and levels of significance. I have to give you a level of significance and an end number. And then finally, what we were talking about in your morality videos, um, there's lots of scientific experiments that are perfectly good science that are immoral and unethical. How long does it take a cat to die when strangled? Now that would be good science, but bad morality. Torturing animals, that's what Jeffrey Dahmer started out doing before he started eating people. All right? Uh, a lot of the experiments that every country has done horrible experiments, but the worst, I'd say, of all maybe were the ones in Cambodia when they wanted to kill two million people. 
and uh, Khmer Rouge, and then the Nazis. And during the after the World War II, when we started really reading the records, because the Nazis were incredibly good scientists, they kept incredible records. And when we looked at their experiments, everyone was appalled. I mean, one of the nicer ones was, how long does it take a human being to die in ice water? Why did they want to know? Because they didn't have many fighter pilots. Their fighter pilots were being shot down over the North Atlantic. They were landing in ice water, and they wouldn't get picked up in time to survive, and they didn't have enough pilots. So they wanted to know, was there a way of dressing them or telling them how to act that they would live significantly longer? So they got volunteers. And you know how Nazis got volunteers. Anybody that was an Aryan, homosexuals, lesbians, Jews, blacks, Poles, communists, Russians, anybody they didn't like. Of course, you know, five million people died in the Holocaust because they didn't like them and they decided to get rid of them. Kind of a eugenics idea that they got from who wrote the eugenics law for the Nazis? Who? Nobody listened to Deadly Deception? Henry Laughlin. Who said it? Somebody said it. Henry Laughlin, the man that wrote the Virginia law that went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, allowing people to be sterilized in the United States with just the opinion of your local sheriff. Your sheriff would decide if you were feeble-minded or defective and could pick you up without a trial or anything and take you to a eugenics colony to be sterilized where you would go through some fake sort of trial where they said, you're not against an operation that will help you, uh, that will better your health, are you? And you would say no, and they say, okay, you can be sterilized. They just wouldn't say sterilized. Go on. And just a second. So Laughlin wrote that law. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it is still legal in the United States. There's any sheriff in the United States, in the 30-something states that have approved eugenics laws, can pick you up and take you and force you to be sterilized or your child. It's still legal. Because if the Supreme Court rules it's legal, until they rule it isn't, it is. And Laughlin was asked by the uh, National Socialist Republic of Germany to write their eugenics law. And he wrote it. And he received an honorary doctorate for it. I'm, I forgot what the name of the university was. And they decided that instead of just sterilizing the mental patients, they would euthanize them. I believe it was 250,000 people they euthanized in the first year of the eugenics law. And then, of course, they carried it on to the 5 million people they killed. So there have been lots of immoral and unethical experiments. Let's see if anybody learned anything from deadly deception. So since there have been so many immoral and unethical experiments, including in the United States, which you saw, in the Tuskegee, the Guatemala, and the eugenics laws, um, after World War II, there was an attempt to institute regulations on morality and science. <coughs> what was the first one? <clears throat> one of your questions. What was the first attempt? The Nuremberg Code. During the Nuremberg trial for the Nazi war criminals, it was decided that there are things that even if you're in the military, you cannot be ordered to do that are inhuman and that you as a human being have a responsibility to resist. And if you don't and you just say, I was following orders, you can be put to death because this is wrong. It's based on the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, but it's called the Nuremberg Code and it is the first incidence of informed consent. You cannot do things to people without telling them and getting their consent. So it's called the Nuremberg Code, and now in the United States, we Congress passed a law establishing these test questions will be on.